now we can let the computers do shit. Why not? Right? Let right. the robots do shit. And so the problem is, um, well, the problem is the technology that we've developed under capitalism is not quite fit for the task. But in principle, it could be developed in such a way that it might be, you know, serve a different purpose. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see... We still, them. to a large extent, live in the interregnum between between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. Yeah, so I was Googling about, uh, I just Googled Adorno and Freud. And I came up. And your essay for the Platypus Review was at the top of my uh, it list. It should, should be, because no one should go without knowing the real deal about Adorno and Freud. It's I, also going to it, be in the book. Yes, the exactly. The of collected essays. I yep. have three essays on, on um, basically Freudian psychoanalysis. I have Adorno and Freud. I have the mass psychology of capitalist democracy. And I have critical authoritarianism which is a phrase that I came up with in the Adorno and Freud piece. Right. Well, I, the reason I was Googling it is because I'm trying to work on yet another critical cuts video. And I thought I would do one about um, the problem of subjectivity mm -hmm. under modernity. And, uh, you know, I, I um, the last video I did on Laurie Anderson was actually kind of about that as well, but I thought I'd try to do one where I actually was clearer and less playful and had something uh, more direct to say. And, um, and uh, you know, I was at a psychoanalytic conference over the last uh, four or five days. Um, in New York, right? In New York, yeah. Where else? Um, right, where else? <laughs> and um, what I found was there was a lot of disavowal of Freud Oh, Among sure. The, the psychoanalysts. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, so here in Chicago, we do have the Chicago Psychoanalytic Institute, which mm -hmm. is like Orthodox Freudian. Mm -hmm. And then the school that I teach at, you know, my side teaching gig, the Institute of Clinical Social Work, they advertise themselves as psychodynamic, which is a euphemism for Freudian. Mm -hmm. But they're definitely like post-Freudian, right? Right. Um, and so they're much more influenced by the people who come later, like uh, Kohut. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, so very few people practice strict Freudian psychoanalysis. Some do. There are some who do. You know, I just know Freud as an academic subject, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and although I do teach Freud, I just came off in January teaching an intense Freud course at the Art Institute of Chicago. Mm. Three weeks, five days a week of Freud, which I guess is almost like Freudian therapy itself, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Psychoanalysis is supposed to be like three or four times a week. Um, and, you know, but I always emphasize there that Freud's not a theorist. He's a clinical practitioner and his theory is totally disposable. He's a very positivist and empiricist and pragmatist notion of his own theory. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he's only interested in the therapy, the clinical, mm -hmm. um, and really the, um, the, his, his view of his own theory is that it's a kind of handy generalization of his clinical practice, right? <laughs> Which I think is easily lost. He's turned into like a philosopher of mind or something. And certainly Lacan contributes to that too, right? And Carl Jung, a lot of people who think of themselves as Lacanians are really Jungians. Wow. And, you know, no, in the sense of they think that it's an ontology. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, uh, but, I mean, Jung had a very mystified, particular, you know, uh, quasi-spiritual ontology. It, it was, uh, for my, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not an academic uh, uh, on this, uh, you know, meaning I don't, I, I can't claim to have a deep understanding of Jung, but my sketchy understanding is that he 
you know, you know, gave rise to a lot of new age kind of thinking that would pick Oh, up sure. And... He was influential. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a funny thing. I mean, the reason that I lump Lacan and Jung together in that way, in that kind of unfair way, is that it's, you know, ontology, it's metaphysical. It becomes about some kind of irreducible fact of psychology, mm -hmm. which, again, Freud is much more, you know, scientific, actually. Meaning, you know, he's not he's not sure about any of that, about any metaphysical claims and certainly no ontological claims, even, you know, because I teach beyond the pleasure principle. And even there where, where it's very speculative and appears to be very metaphysical, um, you know, he's it's always just thinking about the facts of kind of clinical therapy, like what shows up, you know, what seems to be the case rather than, you know, wedded to an idea that then he's like imposing upon people's psychology. Mm -hmm. you know, he's just sort of saying, well, you know, what does it mean to, you know, repeat the past? And, you know, he's got a kind of very, you know, late 19th century kind of um, philosophy of science kind of view of things, you know, about, you know, cause this is obviously the time of quantum mechanics and theory of relativity and that kind of thing. So a lot of, questions are being raised about the nature of physical reality. But one thing, you know, it's almost Bergsonian, this kind of idea that like matter is like, you know, the past, you know, and so like our physical biology is like a kind of legacy of the past mm -hmm. as much as our life experiences, you know, it's like a deeper past as opposed to a more recent past. And so it gets, it sounds kind of ontological there, unless you realize that actually he's thinking about it more scientifically. I want to uh, dive into this, this question about whether or not Freud was transhistorical in his thinking. Right. And, and this is what you're saying uh, seems to me to point to the, that question. Mm -hmm. Um Certainly, I do agree with you about the Lacanian approach to psycho, psycho psychology. Say mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. that there is a um, a claim that uh, that is not imp founded in empiricism, but founded in a rational kind of almost philosophical investigation of Heidegger. Yeah, well, it's really influenced by Heidegger a great deal. Who came first, like Levi Strauss and those people, or Heidegger? I mean, it seems. Oh, to me Heidegger like... came first. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Structuralism comes later, and obviously, structuralism is another influence. And then, of course, there's like the Kojève and uh, Jean Hippolyte like uh, version of Hegel that comes into it. You know, the master-slave dialectic kind of misreading of Hegel. Right. That comes into it too. Um, in terms of the way he interprets transference and Freud, Lacan. But um, there's also just the kind of, the treatment of language is both structuralist and Heideggerian, right? Um, so because, you know, a lot of stuff that we were exposed to in our education, our generation, is a lot of um, mixture. And so it's hard for us, I think our generation like me and you, to discern the lineages of these ideas, a kind of structuralist approach to language mm -hmm. and a Heideggerian approach to language, you know, treating right. language as a, as a tool and as a technology that kind of inframes us and does these things, you know, that kind of strange quasi pseudo Nietzschean kind of philology stuff with Heidegger mm -hmm. and like, you know, how like metaphysics is lodged in our language or something. Mm -hmm. You know, which obviously dovetails with the structuralist stuff, mm -hmm. right? Um, because they're making, you know, kind of, I guess, ontological claims about, like, culture and, you know, thinking of humans as, like, I don't know, bearers of culture, bearers of language, you know, mm -hmm. that's constituting our subjectivity in some way. And Freud's just not about any of that, you know? Like, right. Well, when did the linguistic turn happen? Because I'm thinking, like, the person I should have mentioned was Saussure, who... Oh, so it starts earlier, right? And yeah. that's like linguistics. That's not quite structuralism, though, right? I kind of tie them together. Saussure and the I mean, way we're taught is it sounds like that, right? Whereas mm -hmm. I think that Saussure is more descriptive. You know, okay. Peirce and Saussure are more like descriptive. And in other words, they're not making the kind of structural anthropology. You know, you mentioned Levi Strauss. Um, 
who even Levi Strauss, I feel like I want to, I want to save him from himself or from his influence, you know, cause he's yeah. got a lot of interesting things going on too. And um, I just think that, you know, the danger is reifying these things, you know, reifying right. language, reifying psychology. My basic understanding of, um, of structuralism is that what, what, what was being tackled was the question of how we can arrive at uh knowledge or what it means to know the truth or things like that. And, and that Saussure proposed that meanings and truth statements arise within a system of signs, mm -hmm. linguistic signs, and that they, those signs do not have any relation to an objective world. They're not pointing to the world, but pointing to meanings, which are generated from the system of, of signs. Um, yeah, no, sure. I mean, so I would just say about that, that, um, you know, the truth of like language and linguistic meaning mm -hmm. is a little bit different from an epistemological truth. Well, right. So in other words, I don't think, mm -hmm. Saussure, I don't, I wouldn't say that Saussure is like a linguistic reductionist. Like he's a linguist. In other words, he wants right. to know about the meaning of language. Right. He doesn't want to tie the meaning of everything to language. Right. But those kinds of questions became part of the linguistic turn. I don't know. The, it did. Uh, but that's more the structuralism. See, the structuralism, and that's why I always say, let's not forget the structural anthropology aspect of it. You know, the idea that, like, I don't know, humans, like, fundamentally think in dichotomies, you know, like mm -hmm. male, female, sacred, profane, and that that's, like, the basic structure of all language. Mm -hmm. and therefore of all reason, you know, and it is this kind of, you know, cause I used to teach Levi Strauss mm -hmm. and I used to, you know, say, you know, if you want to know what Levi Strauss is about, it's about, you know, Joseph Conrad exterminate the brutes, meaning don't exterminate the brutes mm -hmm. because they're human too, because all humans have reason. And the evidence of that is that they make these distinctions, male, female, sacred, profane, and it's like, well, that's a pretty thin <laughs> thing to the rest your humanity on, right? And, you know, like, it's kind of like, you know, it's some kind of, uh, you know, claim about the basic structure of cognition. Right. Right. But, but when you start making claims about the basic structure of cognition, you are treading into the terrain of epistemological claims what it is not necessarily it. but it, well. it, can, it can be confused right in other words it can be like you can't know something unless you can say it and it's like i don't know as a visual artist i know that there's a lot i know that i can't say but i do know well okay that's fair um and also science i have a background in science too a lot of like scientific like you know knowledge is not really you know presentable in strictly linguistic terms you know and then you get into like math and that kind of thing and right math yeah and logic. Right. is there a difference between math and logic because there right. is right and so i just feel like you know i'm just like hold your horses children right you know these there's a lot of conflation that you that yeah. can go on but if you if you think about if you're trying to say that you can have knowledge which you can't which is can't not, be put into language, like la right. la, 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 la language, you know, yeah. la long, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. tongue wagging, mm -hmm. you know. But, <laughs> um, can it not be symbolized at all? Is it? Is it? Uh, Maybe it can uh, be symbolized, but then what's a symbol? From difference between dot net, both signs and symbols are graphical presentations, but people often use them interchangeably. The main difference between the two is that a sign is a language on its own and it is used to communicate something to people. It is broader term and symbol comes under it. Symbol is a form of a sign that may have deep meaning. It can be interpreted in different ways since its meaning may not be universally shared by different people. It is not a ludicrous thing to, to decide that... Mm -hmm. By understanding language, we can understand something about what it means to know 
something. That's it's, not, it's not ludicrous. I mean, I right. think analysis of language, I mean, I just think that these things have become specialized fields. And so the problem is when you kind of conflate or stray, you know, in other words, Freud, Freudian psychoanalysis is the talking cure, right? Right. And so, I mean, obviously language is a very highly developed system of signification, we might say, or, you know, a very sophisticated, developed form of expression, you know, and so the talking cure, you know, what can happen in a conversation, right? And what can be uttered, what can be spoken. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that Freudian symbolism, like dream symbolism, mm -hmm. is the same as linguistic signification, Okay. Right. In um, other words, there are images, right? And I mean, that's why I made right. the claim of. Yeah, like, but oh. there, there are images that are spoken about, though. And, and, then, and when you speak about it, the affect is as important as the words. Right. But can that affect be syntactical? Can that affect be rendered uh, as a text? Um, and well, if not, is there, is there a reason why? Then we're in huh? post structuralism, right? Like, in other words, right. what falls between words? Right. And Wittgenstein, right. that, right. you know, all thinking happens not in words, but between words. Right. In other words, the syntactical aporia is really the real significance, because certainly in psychoanalysis, like, yes, syntactical expression is is significant, but it's also significant when people make nonsensical statements. My understanding of post-structuralism was that the claim was that that you cannot find a meaning, um, a clear meaning, uh, even through an analysis of the system of language in a structuralist way, where, you know, not only can we not refer to the real world, but we can't find any fixed meaning within our own systems. System of signs. Right, That's right. signs. And, um, Which is a funny way of coming back around to sanity. You know what I mean? <laughs> Like in other words, it's like, do we really have to go through structuralism and then through post-structuralism to just arrive at, you know, everything isn't what can be said? Sure. Okay. And that makes sense. That's a common sense kind of claim. I totally agree with it. But I what I um uh but what I want to get at is this look, I just for a poetry. moment. I also is wrote this... poetry, Doug. Uh huh. I also what? wrote poetry. What I want to try to avoid, you know, when I when I attempt to actually think <laughs> is being mystified that's creating a category which can't be uh that i can't explain that i can't argue for that i have to just hold uh, now that's very as analytic as of you yeah as that's as, very as analytic of you and yeah. you know I, I have news for you mm -hmm. can't argue for marxism can't why not because it's a matter of practice okay Right. In other words, it's about like actual like working class power in the world. It's not about convincing through argument. It's also if, if I if I had a problem, if I have a problem with Heidegger, my problem is that he holds this category outside of the realm of reason that can't so that it can't be criticized. That it's a priori. It's an, uh, there's an, uh, an assumption around being which can't be scrutinized and and that that is the basis for. Uh, kind of an authoritarian aspect of it can be. I mean, I don't think he's thought. trying. I don't think he's trying to do that. Believe it or not, despite the fact that he supported the Nazis, mm -hmm. I think that actually his impulse is quite anti-authoritarian, which can then, of course, well, be I mean, authoritarian. Yeah, right. there's this long strand of romanticism within the left, even mm -hmm. that is aiming to be anti-authoritarian by uh, challenging systems of rationalization. Mm -hmm. and, and the prioritizing of reason, mm -hmm. but which end up being quite authoritarian. And what I'm saying is reason is not summable by logical propositions a la analytic philosophy. In other words, I do think that people can act on reason, that it is, re you know, second critique Kant. In other words, like, you know, practical reason is not reducible to concepts of understanding. They're not. I, I, I would just say that Reason, as you know, an analytic philosopher might conceive of it, is not sufficient. It's not a sufficient definition of reason. 
but that doesn't mean that it isn't a necessary component of a sufficient definition of reason. That if you we can talk if, you're, about if you're dealing with a, an argument around epistemology or a political argument, and it fails at the level of logical coherence, it fails. You don't have to go further. It fails. Sometimes. And if you no no every time is what I would say. You've, you've if you make heard, an argument, if you make an argument, fallacy, that, fallacy, that, haven't you, Doug? Uh, the fallacy, yes, I've heard of the fallacy, fallacy, but well. <laughs> that that is not the fallacy. Fallacy is not just because something is the fallacy. Fallacy is if something is a fallacy, therefore its conclusions are untrue. That is a fallacy. Yeah, you can say things that are true, that and say them in a fallacious way. Absolutely, but 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 if that but that doesn't mean that as an argument. If you've made a fallacious argument, you should there your conclusions should be taken up. It means that your conclusions cannot be uh, that uh, have to be considered neutral. You here's, don't, another, you don't. here's another Freudian bit. So, mm -hmm. so there were the Marxists who condemned Freud for being an irrationalist. Then mm -hmm. there were the Marxists who appropriated Freud as dialectical. Mm -hmm. And what you will find, you certainly know this, mm -hmm. is that. Dialectics, Hegelian dialectics, Marxist mm -hmm. dialectics, don't mm -hmm. satisfy the criteria of analytic philosophy. They don't. They don't. They actually do not. They're not reducible to Aristotelian logic. They're, they're not, not reducible to it, but they don't. But they, they do don't. violate it all the time. Absolutely. Well, give, give me an example of a uh, argument from contradiction. Okay, but how do you arrive at that contradiction? You don't well, arrive maybe. at that contradiction through mere assertion. No, you or don't. Or through a fallacy. No, no. You arrive at that contradiction through meticulous argumentation along the lines of what an, an analytic philosopher would do. And you then discover the limits of the analytic approach. Not oh, because you violated that, that approach, but because you've stuck to it. Um, well, and like, in, and like in the Parmenides, you know, the, the argument against... Talk uh, about Heidegger. We don't have to go all the way back to Parmenides. We can stick no, with something. Popper. Okay, okay. We could talk. We could talk about uh, the beginning of um, uh, the science, the science of logic. We could talk about. Uh -huh, Hegel. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, the, no, the Hegel's way... not setting out to right, but he's trying to kind of understand the basis for, but also understand the transcendence of Aristotelian logic in the right. modern world. Sure, but he doesn't just assert, "Oh, being and nothing, they're the same thing." No, 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 no. I, no, I, I, no like, yeah, I he, don't think, he, yeah, I don't think it has to be about being, by the way. In other words, I would say if you look at like Marx, mm -hmm. that, you know, someone like Popper is going to object to Marx and on a variety of levels. But Popper would object to Das Kapital because he would say that Marx does a sleight of hand between the empirical and the logical. Okay. And so, in other words, how you arrive at the contradiction, it's, you know, it's why a lot of readers of Das Kapital get hung up on its logical structure versus its historical argument mm -hmm. with that understanding that they're the same thing for Marx. They are right. the same thing. That once you separate those out, then you've kind of lost the plot. You've lost the dialectic. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, how you arrive at the contradiction is also through empirical history, concrete empirical history, and I was just arguing with uh, one of the members of Platypus, long-standing friend of mine, old friend of mine from the Spartacist League, Richard Rubin. And, you know, he doesn't like dialectics. He really hates dialectics, actually. And he said, well, you know, what, what contradiction means to Marxism is not logical, but it's about tendencies. Right? It's about contrary tendencies. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, well, you know, okay, so how do you talk about tendencies? How do you talk about tendencies? In other words, the tendencies are not if they don't flow from logic, then where do they flow from? Right. And so you're left in this place of the logical and the historical and the historical seems to be, you know, empirical data. And it's like, yeah, but you're talking about the dynamics of history, the tendencies of history, and those are never going to be found strictly speaking in the data. It's always going to be in the interpretation of the data. Mm -hmm. Right. Not, which not has to do, which is a return to logic. May, no, I don't you know. know. It, no, it is. It's it, you. If you to have a, a solid uh, foundation for interpretation, you're going to at the very least have to be logically coherent, and and not simply asserting. Um, what if we live in two contradictory realities? Because that's again the Freudian bit about the conscious mm -hmm. and the unconscious. What if we're living in 
actually two contrary realities at the same time. You know, okay. so, you know, when I teach this stuff mm -hmm. about like history and to say, you know, history, historical materialism and dialectical materialism, well, we can't assume what history is, right? In other words, history is not just like the facts of the past, right? History is a dynamic and a tendency, and it's it's a tendency that's very complicated. In other words, it's not linear, mm -hmm. but it doesn't just follow. Right. right. And so that's where I feel like the interpretation, again, you know, I think it goes back to Kant. I do. I think that um, a certain kind of bourgeois thought up to that point, specifically like empiricism, but also, you know, going back to ancient philosophy like Aristotle, I think that there was a realization in the late 18th century by Kant, and that's why he's such an important thinker, and that Hegel follows from this, is to realize that actually those kinds of analyses won't be able to describe freedom. Mm -hmm. right? And yet freedom is not irrational. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, the ability of the conditioned to go beyond its conditions, you know, these kinds of formulations. And, you know, I mean, I'm just very, I, I teach the third critique, you know, because I'm not going to just do the whole first critique. It's just too, too much in the kind of teaching that I do. I mean, you know, if I was in the philosophy department, maybe. But, you know, and con scholars think that the third critique is senility. And it's like, no, that's the crown of his whole philosophy, which Hegel says and others picked up on. You know, in other words, Kant considered his system to be complete with the third critique. And yet people who are looking at it from a more analytic standpoint are mm -hmm. like, oh, he's saying things that don't make any sense. The introduction is an exercise in what Kant calls architectonic. And this he defines as the art of system where system means an intellectual structure that employs ideas, ideas of reason, ideas with a capital I, uh, to transform an aggregate of common cognitions into Wissenschaft, scientific knowledge, a genuine unity. And the key to the architectonic of the third critique, as Kant explains it in the introduction, uh, is not the concept of judgment as such, but the more complex idea that the faculty, the faculty of judgment, which stands between our two other uh, co uh, conceptual faculties, reason and understanding. The faculty of judgment has a, co a connection, a kind of subterranean connection with the faculty of pleasure and unpleasure. And that faculty intermediates between the theoretical and the practical. I just feel like there's reason beyond what the analytic philosophers can account for. There is. <laughs> Okay, right, but I feel as though in order to arrive at that reason, you have to um, uh, stay the course within the analytic style of, or Aristotelian approach, or or maybe uh, find another system. Um, Aristotle but can be forgiven. The 20th century analytics can't be forgiven because they're rejecting Hegel, and they're rejecting a lot of Kant, too, deliberately. Mm -hmm. And they can't be forgiven for that because, you know, Lukács is here to say this is the coming to capitalist reification, reified reason. Okay, so without, I don't feel like I'm in a position to forgive or to condemn most of these I people. Forget. And I, I certainly, I certainly don't, don't think I remember enough to be able to consciously choose to forget things. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. I mean, but like you know anything that comes up, I want to make sure. Again, I like understand Freud, it. I think that Freud, you know, like you know, like I said, I teach Popper, mm -hmm. and Popper is like, you know, he's like, his whole approach is about rejecting Marx and Freud, right? And, and so, because they claim to be scientific, but they're not, right? But the problem with Popper, and since post Popper, is that the in the realm of the philosophy of science, there has been no conclusion as to what what constitutes science. Right. What that, what that what is, is what you know? So and what? That is, so, that's true. But but what I'm saying is, let's take the analytic philosophers at their word. 
Mm -hmm. they're a priori rejecting everything that we want to talk about. Marx. Right. Or... Well, yeah, I agree with that. But so what are we going to do with that? Right. But what I would say is that they haven't been true to their own project enough. If they have, if they to, they no, are I not justified. I think there's a reason. What's why their, they what's why? What's their justified reason for rejecting that? Um, because they feel like they're on uncertain ground, right? In other words, they are kind of reducing. They're trying to achieve a kind of certainty mm -hmm. that isn't available in the terms that they want to pose it in. I like birthday presents best. You don't know what you're talking about. How many days are there in a year? 365. And how many birthdays do you have? One. And if you take one from 365, that means you can get 364 unbirthday presents. You see, Dum Dum? Certainly. And only one for birthday presents, you know? Now there's glory for you. But I don't know what you mean by glory. Of course you don't, till I tell you. I mean, there's a nice knockdown argument for you. But glory doesn't mean a nice knockdown argument. When I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean. Neither more, nor less. The question is whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, which is to be master? That's all. Uh, all I'm saying is that when you, um, when we consider the analytic tradition or, or the structure. Freud was very anxious, by the way, about this. In other words, Freud was very much aware, you know, Freud's a really smart guy mm -hmm. and he's like, you know, does this stand up to logic? Does it stand up to science? Mm -hmm. He's got a lot of anxiety about it, about mm -hmm. his empirical observations and whether he can kind of make the claims that he's making. And that's why he's very kind of sober about it and very modest and very clear about what he can and what he can't say. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that's why he's just like, well, look, this seems to work. And I'm trying to describe how it works. Right. I'm not sure that I'm describing why it works exactly, mm -hmm. which is a little bit of a different kind of assertion, but I am describing how it works and what that might, what we might speculate based on that. You know, okay. like deriving, so, deriving talk, healthy psychology from pathology. That's a weird, you know. Let's talk about Freud a little bit because, you know, yeah. I'm not I've, – I've been – I've got this book uh, on my bedside table that I don't necessarily read, but I've just skimmed through <laughs> the interpretation of dreams. Um, and uh, I – He makes concessions there, you know. He does. Like, you know. Oh, yeah, you know, about his own therapeutic practice right. and his relationship with his patients. Yeah. Um, his own dream about one of his patients is featured. With oh, no, well, that's, that's great stuff. What I'm saying is he also says, like, that he's presenting things as if they're a certain way, but they aren't really, you know, about dream symbolism, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, you know, but, you know, he was mostly read as, like, giving some kind of, you know, archetypology of dreams yeah i mean that's but i don't see i don't see that in what i've read so far and in the interpretation of dreams where no, no, how just, you could how you could take what he says there and create like a dream dictionary seems insane to me but um it does seem insane and yet <laughs> yeah um but what he says is some more general things like uh -huh. um dreams are always wish fulfillments mm -hmm. unconscious wish fulfillments that have gotten past a, a tendency within the psyche to repress mm -hmm. the unconscious so you've you've got this um disguised wish fulfillment uh fantasies that appear in your dreams and <clears throat> that's his starting point and then he can kind of take particular examples and demonstrate uh the how what wishes might be uh, fulfilled through these different dreams that some of them might be terrifying. You might have a nightmare. I was going to say that all raises the question of what a wish is. Right. You know, what right. desire, so why is it, you know, it's a desire that's been repressed. Well, there are, you know, it's coming from the id. It's not, it's an, mm -hmm. uh, it's an uncivilized desire based on what maybe um, the, the, the 
death drive, maybe some destructive impulse in, in the psyche. You don't so here's the tricky thing about wishes and desires. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this is what, like, I don't know, Todd McGowan is on about with enjoyment, mm -hmm. is that the psychological satisfaction comes from the wish itself, not from the fulfillment of that wish. It's the wishing right. that is satisfying mm -hmm. the psyche. Right. It's the wish itself that is a defense mechanism. In other words, it's not that we have defense mechanisms against our wishes. The wish itself is a defense mechanism. We're getting to Freud finally. I was all I was trying to do at the outset here is sort of say, hey, um, you know, we we want to be able to make epistemological claims. We want to jump in the deep end of the pool with Hegel. Yeah. If you're going to do it, you got to do it. Right. And well, right. You but, don't need uh, to. I was trying to hold crap. on. Let me let me say All what right. I was trying to do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I was trying to say we want to make um, you know, be able to distinguish when we are making epistemological claims from when we are not. Sure. See yes. when things rest on those kinds of claims and when they yeah. don't. Um, when if if you have someone who like Freud is wanting to be scientific, what they're wanting to be able to do is make the best possible case for the truth of their own claims that's yeah, what yeah. science is about oh, um so uh to the urge to be scientific is not just to join in with the latest fashion but it's to have an access to overcome epistemological difficulties through empirical research and so you know i'll just theories. i'll just uh invoke Comte again august okay. Comte. Mm -hmm. the only truth mm -hmm. is that we're asking what the truth is mm -hmm. Right. It's thick. It's thick heart. You know, in other words, um, you know, science may not be the realm of truth. In other words, there's a difference between science and philosophy. And mm -hmm. what analytic philosophy has done is reduced what philosophical truth is to the truth of a meaningful, logical statement. Mm -hmm. Right. And again, science is about like figuring out the truth. Right. right. It's not about like asserting the truth or being able to state the truth. Right. It, there are right. hypotheses. You know, it's like, uh, you know, I teach Popper and that's Popper's whole thing. It's logical empiricism. It's, you know, that science is really about hypotheses. It's not about facts or data. And that those hypotheses are, you know, provisional interpretations that are meaningful only insofar as they're falsifiable mm -hmm. right if, because if they're not if they're not testable and therefore in principle falsifiable mm -hmm. then they're not meaningful right Let which, alone. which this is an incredibly deflationary claim yeah um because uh there are many things like the very claim that you know the only meaningful claims are those that are falsifiable which can't be falsified um, although, in fact, that claim has been falsified because people have come along after and said, actually, it is no easier to falsify a claim than it is to demonstrate its veracity. Um, well, that's certainly true. Yeah. yeah so and and uh, the reason to turn towards falsification is because it was uh, apparently easier. It was something that, you know, was a more reliable. Well, test it's for. it's a more accurate description of how science actually proceeds. Right. It's not about like, well, but that, yeah, no, but only it turns out it wasn't right. Well, right. I mean, it's that, I mean, that's what Kuhn, I think. Uh, yeah. Kuhn, I teach Kuhn too. So, you know, the, why did Popper hate Marx and Freud? Because they're verifiable and not falsifiable. They're verifiable, mm -hmm. but they're not right. falsifiable. Verificationism is a family of positions concerning science and philosophy and the relation between the two. Verificationism has both a demarcation criterion and a scientific methodology. The demarcation criterion holds that all and only empirically verifiable sentences are meaningful and scientific, and the scientific methodology holds that science ought to be practiced by attempting to prove hypotheses true using only empirical evidence. Empirical here, of course, means sensory, experiential. Unfortunately for verificationism, it's not only false 
but self-undermining. It's self-undermining because the statement of the theory itself contains non-empirical terms such as meaning. And of course, you can't have a theory that relies purely on empiricism or the empirical that then makes use of non-empirical terms. Even further, though, given that empirical data at best only ever serve to make a hypothesis more probable and never to fully confirm or prove that hypothesis true, verification in terms of certainty is impossible. And finally, Actual science seems to rule out hypotheses by making claims about what is not going on in the world, rather than trying to find evidence in favor of, or proving, or confirming the truth of hypotheses. Finding evidence in favor of a hypothesis is really easy. Even false hypotheses have substantial evidence in favor of. Okay, you're back. I am. Sorry about that. I don't know what's going on. No, it's okay. Um, so, listen, let's go back to um, Freud, and I'm going to just stick to these questions, and uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we'll go through them. So, the, my first question I wrote down as I was reading your essay is this. Was Freud's understanding of drives and the operations of the psyche, uh, which was divided into id, ego, and superego, super was that understanding transhistorical? I think that in his own mind, it's kind of an interesting problem because <clears throat> he would tie it to society or civilization. If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both.